Welcome to the Hunting Illinois podcast. I'm Jason Buckley. With us today, we have Adam and Curtis. So this podcast, we have, uh, it's pretty diverse. So we have, first, we're going to have an interview with Michelle Flambell. She's an extension educator. She works with the SNAP program for the state. And extension's trying to get a deer donation program off the ground where uh, they're doing a pilot study right now where they're going to have it open in some of the central Illinois counties. And then they're going to hopefully expand that out to the whole state. And it's going to be a program where hunters can donate deer uh, to food pantries. So that's a wonderful program. And we like to let everybody know about it. So we're going to talk to her. Then we're going to talk to Adam, who's already been lucky turkey hunting this season. Um, Only took him a day. So we'll talk to him about his experience turkey hunting. And then a unique story that some of you might not have experience with, but Curtis was able to go down to Oklahoma and catch some paddlefish. On the YouTube channel, I'll put up his photos uh, of these large, large paddlefish that uh, he was able to pull out of a river there. So we'll get his story on how that went. But uh, to start the podcast off, let's hear from Michelle Flambell. All right, with us today, we have Michelle Flambell. Uh, She's with Illinois Extension, and she's an educator for them, and she educates people on the SNAP program for the state. And they're starting up a program where you can actually donate deer um, to help some food pantries out. So Michelle, would you like to tell us about your program? Sure. Um, So the purpose of the program is actually to serve as a pilot in hopes that it goes successfully. And we can someday have an up and running statewide program, again, (laughs) thriving statewide program. Um, So the hopeful goal is that we can serve, U of I Extension will hopefully serve as a connector of several audiences. So hopefully the wonderful hunters of Illinois will be generous (laughs) and donate um, some of their harvest, donate some, all, whatever they feel. um, Towards a participating meat processor that we have partnered with, we have 12 counties. Um, that we are focusing on for this pilot in, I guess you could call it East Central Illinois. And if they can bring that harvested deer to the partnering meat processor, that meat processor will then turn that deer into ground venison um, in one pound packages. And then that will be donated to the local food pantry. This program will also reimburse that meat processor for their labor of processing the meat. And we will also be covering um, the transportation to get it to the food pantry. The food pantry then will serve as the education for the ground venison, um, how to prepare it, um, recipes, food demonstrations, all the things we're um, very well versed in (laughs) serving uh, low income audiences. And hopefully then the food pantry will be able to disperse those one pound packages of ground venison to their food pantry clientele. And with the education, go home and prepare a very good, lean source of protein. Awesome. That was a very long answer. <laughs> no, well, yeah. I mean, that's basically the gist of the whole program. You got it right there. Um, that's great. Uh, yeah. So uh, what are, so it's a pilot study. So what are some things that you want to happen so that way you can try to uh, expand it out? So what are some goals that you need to try to hit here to try to get it across the state? Oh, well, goals is obviously partners. Um, mm-hmm. I'm finding. Um, everyone's a key part as you saw with the timeline of the program that we just described without one key part it kind of all falls apart correct sure. so it starts with the hunter being able to generously donate the meat processor being able to um, take on um, this endeavor for us during the height of their season as well and then the food pantry being able to store it and the food client pantry clientele um, willing to take it home and consume it So there's lots of key parts here, um, but we greatly appreciate all of the partnerships and hopes of a very successful program. Um, I really do think venison is a lean source of protein. It's a great source of protein. It's obviously plentiful here in Illinois with white-tailed deer. Um, And I don't feel like that resource has been well tapped into. And in this time that we're living in, that is something that would be beneficial for food pantry clientele especially. Um, they're struggling. Food pantries are struggling. Lots of people are struggling at this time. So this is something we can do to help. Sure. Um, are you guys modeling after uh, other states that have been successful with this or um, have other states done th- similar things? I think I've heard of uh, like Michigan, I've know had a, a pretty successful program. Yes. Um, so everyone does it differently. Mm-hmm. We're not really modeling. The only um, not really modeling that I know of. Um, we're just serving as the pilot because the state is obviously has lots on their plate right now. 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And we hopefully, I'm sure we're going to learn something, lessons learned from this pilot in order to broadcast it statewide. Sure. Yep. So where can people go to find out more about the program? And I see that kind of the list of the meat processors that you guys already have signed up for the program. Yes. Um, So we do have a website. Um, It's go.illinois.edu backslash deer donation. Um, We are looking for partners, as I said, um, whether you're a hunter, a meat processor, a food pantry, or someone that's just um, excited about the program, we'd be happy to partner with you. Um, We're always looking, obviously, as well for donations (laughs) to reimburse those meat processors um, for their hard work. And we obviously appreciate the time and effort that the hunter is putting in to um, being generous to us, to donating their harvest and doing what they love to do. So I hope that not only do we get to help people that are in need, but we also get to fulfill a love of the outdoors for hunters around Illinois as well and do something you love and help someone at the same time. Absolutely. And um, and from my end of it, I mean, just we're, we're out here trying to get more hunters involved and providing wild game to families that may not have even tried wild game before uh, you might spark some interest in trying to go out and provide their own wild game uh, when they're able to. Yeah. So I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. My, my family has hunted deer forever, mm-hmm. but recently until I was, um, my husband is a deer hunter and he would bring home deer and I had to learn how to cook it. But now that it's just part of our family, it's just part of what we do. Mm-hmm. And you just kind of, I don't know, adapt. And now I wouldn't have it any different. I would prefer deer sometimes over beef and certain recipes so there's just certain recipes that it goes really well with and I hope that we can share those with low-income audiences as well Mm -hmm. no absolutely I know I grew up on it myself I mean we probably my family probably eat about 60 or a year um in Pennsylvania Pennsylvania, my dad would get uh you can get doe tags there for like nine dollars a doe tag back in the 90s (laughs) I don't know what the rates are now but um (laughs) no we used to we ate plenty of deer and it was definitely cost efficient when you get that many of them for sure. Oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah. Not six deer. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> My family, family of five, we eat one, but yeah, I bet we could do two. And then he, he also would give them out too. I think he, it's uh, I think hunters do this already um, with their yes. friends, friends and family as well. Um, so uh, if you, if you have extra and you can go and give it to a food bank, I mean, what, what better calls than that? Yes. Um, and I think you bring up a good point is some people have already been doing this for years, meat processors, hunters, pantry, they've already always been doing this. So why not recognize them, reimburse them for their labor Mm -hmm. (laughs) as well. Um, So I'm hoping all of their good efforts will be paid off in the end. Sure. You hope it works out. (laughs) And then um, does the name, does the program have a name uh, with it? Does it have a title? It's the Illinois Deer Donation Program. Um, So nothing too fancy. No. I like it. But you can recognize it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no crazy acronyms. We're known for those in extension. So we just yes. kept it simple. Illinois Deer Donation Program. Awesome. Yep. Well, thank you guys. Mm-hmm. We hope you have for the best of luck. And uh, hopefully we'll get some updates here uh, after the season's over to see how it all turned out. Sounds good. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. So thank you so much, Michelle, for, for taking the time out to talk to us today about the program. Again, it sounds like talking to her, honestly, they have a lot of hunters lined up already, which is awesome to hear that people are being that charitable. But what they really need right now is donations for funding the deer processing part of it. So they have a donations page that we're going to link to on the descriptions of this video or podcast, whatever way you're hearing this. And um, you can go there and donate to help fund the butchering of the deer. But that sounds like a great program, huh, guys? Oh, awesome. Awesome program. I really hope it, uh, it takes hold because I mean, that's something that may even allow some people to hunt longer. Maybe their freezers filled up, but they'd like to go out and still have some adventures, but, uh, they don't know what to do with the game. So, um, having a strong donation program is awesome. Plus just, um, it's nice to be able to share such uh, local wholesome protein with um, folks who may not have a chance to hunt and uh, may get them excited about trying hunting in the future too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people can try wild game for the first time possibly and see that it's not scary and it might be something they even like and maybe we'll go out and try to get their own. Ooh, yeah, they may, sure. they may like it better. Yeah. I mean, Hopefully if you're lucky enough this season to uh, all donate a deer, that'd be pretty awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, and then talk going back to donating money for the butchering. I mean, if you're if you're in a position where you can be charitable and uh, and can donate money to different charities, I mean, I don't know a more cost effective way of donating money for a deer processed compared to going to the grocery store and spending the same amount of money it takes for a deer to get processed and getting that same poundage of meat to go to a food pantry. I think that's actually pretty cost effective. Oh, for sure. It's almost like they're donating to um, hunters, a cause that that's good for hunters. And at the same time, you're donating to uh, something that's good for the needy, the local hungry people in a, in a local environment. So and you're keeping all the money, all the food, everything local, like win, win, win. Yeah. Yeah. And then the deer processors tend to be pretty local businesses that are ran. Um, so it's not like a big meat packing plant they're taking these deer to. I, yeah. Again, win, 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 win. So that's an awesome program. And we're just here to support it and get the word out. Thanks again. And um, let's move on. All right. So Adam, man, you, you already went out and uh, you filled your tag turkey hunt. You want to go through the turkey story of how... Slayer. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why whenever we have workshops, we always point to Adam and be like, you got questions, go ask Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yes, turkey season is definitely my uh, favorite time of the year, my favorite species to hunt in Illinois. And uh, a little bit bittersweet, uh, tagged out by about 6.45 on opening day. So didn't really get to do too much hunting. Uh because it went by pretty quick, but I'm also very happy that I was successful and got to harvest a nice turkey. Uh, he's all cut up in the freezer already, ready for us to enjoy some good turkey nuggets and, you know, some tacos probably and all sorts of good stuff. But uh, I guess I'll just go through how the hunt went and kind of the scouting I did. The Yeah, Adam, days. I mean, yeah, I'm so sorry to cut you off, but, but yeah, man, to start at the at the beginning, like how did you set yourself up? To where you could tag out at 6 30 in the morning monday well i went uh over to turkey camp on friday so my i did a few days of scouting a week or two prior but i really hit it hard last friday season opened on monday so friday night i went out to the piece of public land that i was hunting listened bounced around to a few parking lots to just kind of get an idea of where the turkeys are and where they're roosting uh, unfortunately the weather kind of, I believe still has them a little, uh, grouped up and they're just kind of not acting like, you know, the spring turkeys that you see on, you know, YouTube videos or something like that, where they're just all running around trying to chase, uh, hens and do all that stuff, which they definitely are. They're breeding, uh, and, and they're getting there, but the weather kind of has them a little, uh, not as vocal and I guess just moving a little slower still. Um, so I did a listen Friday, woke up Saturday morning early, went and listened in the same areas, did the same thing Saturday night. And then again, Sunday morning, it was super windy Sunday night. So I did not go out just knowing that I wasn't going to hear much different than what I've already learned in the past couple days of scouting. But yeah, I would just bounce around to different parking lots and uh, walk in a little bit to where, you know, there was some big ridges and I would uh, owl hoot essentially and crow call just to see if I can get some sort of response to just locate the turkeys. And uh, the one evening I did go, it was a little bit rainy and I walked in a little bit further than I did the previous previous day and actually I did see uh, some hens that just got up onto the ridge and a, a male tom following them and they were kind of drying off and shaking off before they flew up into the roost uh, just because they were kind of wet all day and I believe that is the turkey that I did harvest which is pretty cool because Monday morning when I went back to that same spot we got there pretty early uh, set up there was only a couple turkeys that were vocal that morning in that area I heard some way off in the distance but the other two were lonely I believe and the one I saw had uh, like five or six hens with them and the one I did harvest also had five or six hens with them. So it makes me think that it that was the turkey that I saw the previous day, which is pretty cool. But yeah, so basically I just set up where I knew that there was going to be turkeys. You know, we talk about a lot that, you know, the roost hunt doesn't always work out, but you got to start somewhere, right? You always want to know kind of a spot to, to give a roost hunt your best effort. And if that doesn't work out, you kind of you know, move on throughout the day and kind of go for a hike and call around and see if you can get anything to respond. I got lucky enough that the turkey flew down from the roost. He was milling around with his hens for about 20 minutes. 
Uh, wasn't very vocal, but he did gobble a few times on the ground, and we can tell that he was getting closer and closer. And finally, he walked up behind me. We had the decoy set out probably about 25 yards in front of us on the corner of a field, and he popped up behind me, not where we expected him to, but I just heard him kind of scratching at the leaves, and the hens were kind of milling around as well. So I just turned my head super slow, caught something you know, like a dark blob out of the corner of my eye. So I knew he was standing there and he must've caught me looking at the same time that I was looking at him. We kind of saw each other at the same time. And I just waited for his head to turn back towards where he just came from to go back down the ridge, swung 180. He walked behind a big white oak and popped out just to the left of it. And by that time I was ready and my safety was off and kind of figured that he would pop out just to give it one more check. And that's exactly what he did and got to harvest a, a opening morning turkey, which was pretty awesome. Nice, man. So a big question I have is, are you going to uh, do some of that turkey the same way uh, we did the turkey in the workshop here a couple weeks ago? Yes, for sure. That is my favorite preparation. I love making turkey nuggets. Uh, there's a few things that just taste really good fried, and I think that's crappie and turkey, and that's just the way I like to do it. I like to mess around and do some other stuff once in a while too, but I kind of like to stick with the the tried and true when it comes to turkey. For sure. Got to do it at least once. Yep. Yep. Are you going to mount anything? I know uh, we had one question on our Facebook connections page that uh, they asked any suggestions on how to utilize feathers or, or any other part of the bird uh, without, they said that they didn't really agree with trophy mounts, which is their preference. Um, do you guys, have you ever mounted one before and or used it for other purposes? Yep, yep. So on this particular turkey, I've, I've never like full mounted anything, uh, which would be cool maybe down the road. But I was probably just thinking of doing a fan mount with a beard because he did have a nice fan on him. So that's kind of my, that's what I'm thinking of doing with them. But there's times where I haven't kept the fan and just kind of kept the spurs and the beard and made a little, uh, you know, little ornament or something you can call it. And just I hung it off an antler off of a Euro mount I have of a buck. So you don't need to do anything. I always kind of like to keep uh, a few mementos from the hunt uh, just because, again, turkeys are my favorite species to hunt. But could make a wing bone call out of the, the actual three bones that are in the wing itself. Um, I did keep a piece of the wing from this bird to carry around with me to kind of imitate fly downs if I ever have to do that, because um, I've never kept one before. So I figured might as well have another trick in my, my uh, you know, vest for turkey hunting. But yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, speaking of that, if you're looking for other like kind of utilitarian uses that you can use for uh, wings and the tail fan, if you use some borax or something like that and dry it out where it's stiff, uh, you could make a pretty nice uh, fan out of either the tail fan or the wings. Uh, that's a cool way to just keep the flies off you at the barbecue and cool down a little bit when the sun's beating down and you're listening to the ball game and grilling up some, uh, some turkey brats this summer. Yeah. Or even you can use the feathers and the actual fan to uh, put on a decoy as well and make your decoy look a little bit more lifelike. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've never the old that's, decoy. Yep. That's definitely something. That's a project I definitely want to do down the road. Awesome. Well, you already tagged out. Uh, you got any other plans for this, this season, Adam? We are working on filling another first season tag for uh, a newer hunter uh, that I'm friends with. Uh, we got a couple more days to do that, and uh, I know of some other people that might need some help down the road throughout the season, so that's the plan. Share the love with everybody else. I hear you. We'll probably, I'll probably get you out there fifth season at some point. That'd be great. Cool. I'm not sure if you're at liberty to speak, but have you uh, smelled any morel mushrooms out there while you were traipsing about? Well, I... I don't know if I can confirm nor deny that one. <laughs> uh, just kidding. No, nothing yet. Uh, we, were, we were looking pretty good at some spots that looked like they should be productive uh, while we were walking around in the woods the past couple of days, but have not seen anything yet. So I think we're still 
a good I don't I, I don't know it's hard to tell with the weather I would I would say a good couple days away maybe a week but it looks like it's going to be chilly again uh, next week so I don't know how that will affect the mushrooms honestly yeah, I mean the ground temp is going to be less volatile than the air temp but definitely I mean I think it has a chance of prolonging the season I like it when it gets cold this time of year folks have already found them in Vermilion County I haven't seen any um confirmations in champagne but um they're here i'd be looking on the any south uh, facing slopes and um the peak is still to come but there's yep, yep. there's definitely there's some little grays out there right now and a lot of people say they're the best i like them all but um finding that first mushroom of the year that's uh you, you remember that the whole year for sure yep yep yeah it looks like um you know, like we follow a couple of the morel mushroom pages on social media, just where people post uh, confirmations and pictures like that. It looks like they're finding them a lot more frequently, just about a couple of counties south of Champaign and Vermilion. So it's definitely just around the corner. Oh, yeah. And folks in southern Illinois, get out there. It's uh, it, it might be peaking right now. Yep. Yep. Yeah, well, congratulations, Adam. Uh, another congratulations is going to go to Curtis here because of these fish that he was able to land. I mean, these are monsters when it comes to some freshwater fish that are available here. Curtis, you want to go over your trip? Yeah, definitely. It was a pretty cool thing. Not in Illinois, of course, but um, down in Oklahoma. Uh, paddlefish is a pretty big deal down there. A lot of the folks call them spoonbill. Uh, easy to see why I've got that big uh, sort of paddle shaped um, bill basically without that they'd look like a shark but they've got this big paddle to help funnel the water through their mouth and their filter feeders so uh, you can't you're not going to cast anything and catch these these fish so some states like Oklahoma they have a snagging season um specifically for paddlefish and, and that's what we were doing we were down in the uh, neosho river there in the northeastern port of, uh, portion of oklahoma and pretty cool neat way to fish kind of using the sonar to uh, uh just kind of go around the river in the boat and mark fish and we'd find little pockets of them and and kind of target them that way and you're throwing five ounces of weight and uh, kind of jerking that through the water. It's it's um, it's a workout. It's definitely not your leisurely sitting by the the pond with a, a can of worms type of fishing. I'm I'm still all bruised up. I mean, I look like I I went uh, three rounds with Will Smith over here, but um, uh, but definitely worth it. I was able to land two fish, which is the Oklahoma season limit. You can keep one a day, two per year. And so I got my, my annual limit. One was, we didn't weigh it, but it was somewhere in the mid thirties. And then uh, the larger fish I caught was 47. So a lot of fun. Um, some of the biggest fish I've caught in fresh water. And I was there with family and friends and um yeah uh, a lot of fun something different and catching a different kind of fish they're a, a cartilaginous fish like sharks and uh they've been around since like the dinosaur time so um it's just kind of exciting to get to catch something new in a new way and get to try uh something like that so i'm super excited haven't tried any yet but soon um and I'm, I'm looking forward to that part almost as much as I was to catching them. Yeah. Uh, what kind of, what, what do they taste like, Curtis? You, do you know yet? Or what, what, well, what is this, what's the word on the street on how they taste? Yeah. So uh, my brother and dad cooked some up and so did um, a friend of mine, actually the coordinator for the Wisconsin Trappers Association cooked some up. And so the reports I've heard, very, very good. It's a very dense a uh, white meat fish. It's almost like a cross between fish and uh, chicken. So I'm uh, I'm super excited about it. It kind of reminds me if anybody's fished in the Gulf, uh, cobia. That's kind of how I describe cobia. It's like a cross between fishing and or 
fish and chicken, which I guess you can call fishing. Um, <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a big fan of that combo. And uh, yeah, so looking forward to it. The jury's still out on the paddle fish, but I'm going to try it before our next podcast and I'll, I'll report on it for sure. That's awesome, Curtis. Glad you got to go out there and experience that and congrats on the what looked like to be two giant fish i mean i don't know how big they tend to get but those look uh, oh yeah no i was uh, super thrilled with that size they do get up i think the oklahoma record is like in the 160 pound range so they uh yeah they're like swimming volkswagens for sure but um but yeah, I'm I'm not disappointed with a 35 and a 47 at all. And both of mine were males. Um, the females are highly sought after because uh, caviar and it's highly um, it's highly restricted. Like you can't um, get it over state lines. So if you do harvest a female, um, you have to either consume that uh, within the state or dispose of it in certain ways so it's uh it's kind of a big deal that's awesome all right now it's time for critter trivia so while researching turkeys kind of the fun facts of turkeys i found that they really weren't harvested for their meat until around 1935 at least farm raised turkeys before that they were raised for their plumage and for their feathers like for fashion and stuff so how many feathers does a turkey have on average. So it's going to be a range. But uh, so how many feathers does the turkey have? That's going to be the critter trivia question. And we'll talk about that next podcast. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Um, Congrats to Curtis and uh, Adam there for his bird and their fish. And thank you again to Michelle for talking to us about that deer donation program. Uh, Again, donate if you can. Links in description. All right. We'll see you next time.